achieved. Yes, I did predict him to win the main event at UFC 194, and I did talk about the significance of the straight left and how it would play a massive role in his victory, but I could not fathom, nor did most other people, be able to predict or even suggest that it would happen in such abrupt and dramatic fashion. Welcome back to Kamikaze Overdrive MMA Predictions. As always, I am your host, Scott Johnson, and on this episode of the show, we're breaking down the upcoming UFC on Fox 17 event, which will take place on December 19th. Four main card fights, which I'll be breaking down for you on this episode of the show, including a lightweight title fight. This is also the final fight of 2015, so make sure you check back in after this as I will post my awards and 2016 prognostications, 2015 awards, 2016 prog prognostications. Also, recap last year's show, because I did say on last year's show, by the end of 2015, Conor McGregor will be the UFC's featherweight champion. Now, I'm... Uh, where was I going? Yes, that's what I was talking about. Conor McGregor absolutely obliterated Jose Aldo, and that capped off a pretty good run for me overall as, as far as the predictions were concerned. Looking at my records, I had two fantastic nights, one not-so-great night. Uh, I went 10-1 and one on UFC Fight Night 80, only losing Omari Akhmedov, which, which cost us 150 units because he was the only one I lost on that card. I still won a significant amount. Uh, I went 3-5 five, and five on the Ultimate Fighter 22 finale, but those three wins resulted in my, me winning my gold parlay, which still produced. And then I won a successive, not, impressive 9-3 at UFC 194. Overall, we produced 169.15 units uh, in winnings through the three bet packs. It's a pretty good return. And the DraftKings returns were huge as well, including one individual who uh, contacted me and showed me a screen capture to show me that he used my bet pack and he used one of the drafting teams I post, as I usually post too, Joseph Kahout. I'm hoping I pronounced that right, Joseph. And he won the Frank Mir experience. So he gets to go and go to our, the next week's show, UFC and Fox, hang out with Frank Mir, sit cage side with Frank Mir, and I've sent him off a Kamikaze Overdrive hat, a red hat. So check out, uh, look for that when you're watching, and congratulations, Joseph. He won a ton of money. I got a number of people contacted me, actually, with screen capture, some of which I posted on my website, showing how much money they pulled in from DraftKings. It was a pretty darn impressive night overall. And my, my prelims, or sorry, my overall upset predictions were fantastic. I picked, over the three days, Tiago Santos, Rose Namajunas, Worley Alves, Joel Romero, Luke Rockhold, and Conor McGregor all picked up massive upset victories. The Worley Alves one was fantastic because I talked about how he would catch Colby Covington digging for a takedown along the cage. He stuck his head in, boom, guillotine, fight over. Don't want to toot my own horn, but I have to take advantage of that. I am only posting UFC on Fox 17. It's the final bet pack of the year, 10 bucks. So you certainly want to invest in that bet pack, get yourself you know, into the final year, and then we will start a new subscription service heading into 2015. I'm very much looking forward to that. Or 2016, my apologies. Wow, the year flew by. Uh, my preliminary predictions will be available. Definitely check out the prediction panel as well. Some very good predictors there who had some very good weekends as well. So they are worth uh, looking into. Again, I had the opportunity to only have four fights to really ramble on and talk about the event. Uh, is there anything else I wanted to cover? Yes, thank you very much as well. As I set a record on Thursday night for visits to my website, I, then I, I broke that record on Friday night for visits, destroyed that record. And then on Saturday, I, I got my second most visits ever to my website. It didn't break the official record. It's because a lot of people probably came in Thursday and Friday and saw a lot of my picks posted then. But it was close. It would have broke it had I had it included the predictions that came, or the visits that came after 12 o'clock. Uh, I did do live coverage of USC 194, which was a lot of fun. I don't know how often I'll do that either way. I'm also tweeting. You can follow us on Twitter at, uh, sorry, just so many different things I want to talk about briefly before we get into the main card predictions. Twitter, we are at KO underscore predictions. Also check us out on Facebook. Just search, search Kamikaze Overdrive MMA predictions and we should show up. We're constantly posting things there. That's enough rambling from me. I'm sure I forgot something, but either way, uh, we have four awesome fights. Let's get to that first main card prediction. We open the main card up in the UFC's women's strawweight division as ultimate fighter semifinalist and the number 8th ranked fighter in the division, the quiet storm, Randa Marcos, with a current record of five wins and three losses. Takes an undefeated UFC debutante 7-0, Karolina Kovakevich. I'm probably mispronouncing that. I... I'll do my best to uh, improve upon that. Uh, and I said this is the debut for Kovacevic. She's coming in. She's the former KSW World Champ in the same in the uh, strawweight division. She fought one time in Invicta, which she won. It was a very good fight. It was a very close fight. She won by split decision. For Marco, she's coming off her first official UFC win, which was a decision over Aisling Daly, and she built a ton of momentum and really came out of nowhere on the Ultimate Fighter, defeating Tisha Torres, submitting Felice Herrig, losing eventually to Rose Namajunas in the semifinals, uh, and then she dropped dropped a very entertaining split decision to Jessica Penn 
Rene in the her UFC debut. For Marcos, she's recently moved to Montreal to train at TriStar. She's quit her job. I think she's focusing more full-time on MMA, so we'll see if that uh, improves her game. It should. She seems like she's quite the fighter who's willing to you know make sacrifices to improve her uh her craft. Uh, she is one inch taller. They are the same age. Kovakevich will have a two inch reach advantage, though. Now, looking at the Canadian first, she's a BJJ purple belt. Uh, three wins as a professional by submission, two and two in fights that go the distance. She also, as I said, submitted Felice Herrig on the show, and she really outworked uh, Tisha Torres in her decision fight, which caught a lot of people off guard. I believe she was ranked 13th or 14th going into it, and Torres was ranked, I think it was third, and she really shocked the world when she, or shocked the MMA world when she pulled that upset. Uh, for K Kovacavich, she comes with one win by TKO, two submission victories, and four on the scorecards. She has had back-to-back -back split decision wins since taking a step up in competition. Nonetheless, she's looked very good. All three of her finishes have come in the opening round. Now for Kovacavich, she's a high volume, high output striker with high volume combinations. She has excellent head movement, nice straight right, inside low kick. She finishes her combinations frequently with a, with that low kick. She'll start combinations to the body and then she'll rise up and go over the head and really change levels nicely. She'll throw a side kick, sneak in an uppercut. She also will throw elbows at range and she's a good, decent, you know, pretty decent counter striker. There's some good footage of, out there, of her out there striking. Definitely check that out. Uh, she can also strike effectively at close range. She's very effective at doing damage in tight. I like the way she controls her opponent's head and throws short strikes in succession. She'll attack off the break as well, which I think a lot of fighters don't do enough of. And she has, you know, it doesn't take her a bit, you know, she doesn't have a ton of knockouts, but she can still generate some power and get some good snap on her punches in close and look for her to mix in some knees as well. For Marco, she's excessively, very aggressive on the feet. She throws a nice left jab. She'll double and triple it up sometimes. She threw a Superman or, I guess, Superwoman punch in one of her last fights, and it was a pretty decent technique. And training at TriStar, we could see a little bit more of that uh, take place. She can counter strike, but her best weapon is that big right hand. She'll throw a lot of times in single strikes. She keeps it cocked at all times, and, you know, it's pretty quick, and she can catch opponents it's coming in and just crack him with it against Aisling Daly. She was doing that a lot of the time. And as I said, it's always cocked and ready to go. Uh, we also saw in her last fight a couple of spinning back fists, a turning side kick, a little bit more of that flashy technique that, you know, it's, you know, kind of a mix of, uh, you know, good and bad. It, you know, if it lands great, if it doesn't, it might throw you to position or at least cost you some energy. Look for a close distance between, behind her strikes, clinch, and if she can take the fight to the ground. I would think in this matchup, she's going to want to work her wrestling. Against Jessica Penne, she really seemed to focus on trying to keep Penne on the mat, despite how good Penne is there on the ground. Uh, in that fight, you know, when Marcos had a chance to escape off the ground, she jumped right back into the guard. She eventually lost position in that fight, and that probably cost her a lot of the matchup. Nonetheless, she seems like she's a fighter who's focused on going to the mat. Uh, Kovacevic, in her last fight, she was, or in her Invicta fight, she was taken down by Mizuki in one match, uh, one opportunity with a hip toss, and she got her back taken in her last matchup back in KSW. But, you know, she has shown on most takedown attempts she has very good balance, especially in her hips. Her opponents were able to elevate and control that body and still couldn't take her off her feet. Now, we did see in her last fight she didn't throw as many kicks, which could have been out of fear of being taken down. Either way, she was still able to get the win with her output with her boxing. Marcos, though, she's an exceptional scrambler. And if she can get on the mat and get in any position to just get it there, she has a very good possibility of getting on top. And that's, you know, important. Uh... But at the same time, she's lost positions looking for takedowns and being too aggressive. And that's something she does not want to give up against Kovacevic as well. Uh, in looking at Marcos, in both of her fights, she's had issues backing up. Where she's not, when she's not attacking and going forward, she tends to back up a little bit too much and let her opponents come, you know, be aggressive. We also saw her taking some big breaths against Jessica Penne, which was, you know, it was a grueling matchup and really draining on her. And Penne had more success when she was pushing forward. And that's something, you know, maybe Marcos is the type of fighter. She's one fighter when she's going forward. She's an entirely different fighter when she's going backwards. Against Aisling Daly, another grueling matchup, she was certainly slowing down. And that let Daly right back into that fight in, the round, in round two. Keep on mind also, Marcos has been cut in a couple of her matchups. And while she's extremely tough, it could, be, it could work against her, against a fighter who's able to do a lot of damage with her hands. If she can take uh, Carolina down with consistency, she's going, you know, that's her key to victories. I think she's going to struggle to keep up with the technical aspects and the volume of Carolina's striking. Uh, Kovacevic, you know, she's fended off back-to-back -back opponents' attempts to get them up fight to the ground. Who have, They have a lot of submissions. They're veteran fighters, a lot of submissions, good wrestling, and she's able to can keep it standing in both matchups. I think Kovacevic's high-volume striking carries her, carries her in this matchup. I think she's going to crack Marco. She's going to hurt her. She's going to really bust her up. And as Marco slows down, Kovacevic is going to really open up. And my prediction is Karolina Kovacevic to defeat Randa Marcos by decision. Up next, we're in the UFC's lightweight division as Ultimate Fighter finalist, number five ranked Michael the Menace Johnson, 17-9-0, takes on former title challenger 
14th ranked Nate Diaz with a record of 18 wins and 10 losses. Now Johnson, he was heading towards a title shot before his controversial decision loss against Benil Dariush, and whether you agree with it or not, it probably sets him back a step or two, and he needs to rebound and get some momentum going. For Diaz, his last fight was over a year ago, so he's been out of action for a little bit, and he got absolutely thrashed by the man who went on to win the title in Rafael Dos Anjos. We'll talk about him shortly. He also missed weight for that matchup, and Diaz overall is 1-3 in his last four fights, with his only victory coming over a, a failing, faltering Gray Maynard. Now, Diaz's last uh, fight, as I said, led Rafael de Santos to a title shot. It would appear the UFC is trying to use his name to build up top contenders and to give guys significant wins to go forward on. Physically, Nate, two inches taller. He'll have a three-inch reach advantage. MJ is one year younger. Now, looking at Johnson first, he's a former national junior college uh, wrestler. Seven wins by knockout, including Gleison Tebow and Danny Castillo. Seven and three in fights that go to decision, including victories over Tony Ferguson. We just saw put on a fantastic performance. A fight I forgot to mention that was absolutely fantastic and will be in my fight of the year uh, candidates. He also has a decision win over Edson Barboza, the other participant in that matchup. He is two and six in fights ended by submission, which is certainly a red flag take when you take on Nate Diaz. For Diaz, be JJ Black Belt. He is 14 and 1 in fights ended by submission, submitting Jim Miller, Takanori Gomi, and Melvin Gillard to name a few. He has four wins by knockout, including the aforementioned Maynard. But he is two and eight in fights that go the distance. So not a great record in this, you know going on the scorecards. But one of those two victories is against the man fighting for the title on this card, Donald Cerrone. So a lot of crossover. Uh, and it shows where Nate Diaz has been competing at the highest of levels. For Diaz, he's an ec excellent grappler, high-volume boxer, very good cardio. He has been figured out, though. You know, The question is, has he been figured out, though? Or has he just not improved and uh, added dimensions to his game? And, uh, and that's why he's struggling now. One of the big issues, though, he's had a lot of problems with power wrestlers. Uh, we saw Benson Henderson dominate him. We saw Rafael DeSantis have a lot of success with that aspect of him. Of his game. For Michael uh, Johnson, very aggressive, pressure based striker. Decent wrestling. We, he's used doesn't use it a ton, he uses it more actually in reverse to keep fights vertical. He has had issues with cardio. It seems to have improved it of late, but it still has been a problem, and it could have cost him a little bit against Dariush as he slowed down in the, in the second half of that matchup. His submission defense has been a major issue, as the uh, poor submission record would suggest, and he has been out wrestled at times in fights, losing to Miles Jerry, getting smothered on the on the ground. Also, his chin's a bit of a question mark, as we saw him get uh, dropped by Danny Castillo. He's never been knocked out as far as I can remember, but he was dropped by Danny Castillo and nearly knocked out in that fight. For Johnson, he has very good footwork, a lot of lateral movement, he throws a long right jab, he will go to the body of the strikes, and he can really open up on his opponent when he gets him backed against the cage, which is something that I really like, you know, the way he does that. Uh, his output as it did drop off in the second half against Dariush, and he was getting pop of the right jab in that final round. That's something I expect to see him address and really come out and be more aggressive. At the same time, pace himself. He, we've seen him go three rounds with no problem in other fights. Uh, another thing he does too much, I don't think it'll be a big factor in this fight. He, when he, opponents do try and take him down, he does, gets his hips back very nice. He gets them out of the way where they can't grab him, and his movement makes him very hard to track down overall. For Diaz, he looks to be in better shape based on some pictures we've seen circulating on the internet. We'll see if that holds up here. He throws a nice right jab, flashes it out, and keeps it pumping into his opponent's face. Even if it's not doing damage, it's disrupting their timing. He'll throw a little body and kick to the body, which is, you know, it's kind of a front kick. It's We don't know how effective it is, but still, it's one of those things that keeps fighters honest. He's at his best when he's moving forward, putting punches together in those big high volume barrages and, and really wears guys out and goes to the body. You know, just like his brother he's, Nick, is that Stockton slap, you know, low percentage, at least low power percentage striking that really wears guys out. And then he starts snapping bigger shots through. When he fought Dos Anjos, he was getting backed up. He didn't have the same volume. He seemed incapable of keeping up with uh, RDA's output and the variety of his striking. And I think the movement of Dos Anjos was really making it tough for Nate to land and find, you know, find his rhythm. He was also getting busted up with some brutal low kicks in that matchup. It was clearly hurting him, clearly taking away some of his spring and ability to move. And again, with the poor weight cut, you wonder if he had some issues in training camp that uh, ultimately cost him and his ability to do what he does well. He wasn't able to stay vertical in that fight either. I would say this is probably it for Nate Diaz against top-level competition if he cannot pick up the victory. He said frustration with the UFC, both him and his brother, and if you know he loses this fight, they might say, you know what, it's time to, to, time to move on. I'm not 100% sure of what his contract status is, but uh, we'll go from there. Johnson, though, I think he uses his speed, footwork, and more diversified striking to get the better of the exchanges. He could look to take Nate down and really work on that wrestling aspect of it. There are concerns over his submission game, his defense and cardio and outputs. So there are some vulnerabilities that Nate could take advantage of, but I think... The things that Michael Johnson has going for him in this fight far outweigh what Nate Diaz has going for him, and they're at different stages in their career. And my prediction is Michael Johnson did defeat Nate Diaz. I'm going to take Johnson by TKO. I think he hurts him and eventually pours it on and finishes him in a similar fashion to what uh, Josh Thompson did. So Johnson by TKO. 
We move now to the co main event of the evening, and we are in the UFC's heavyweight division. It's the number two ranked fighter in the division and former UFC heavyweight champion, Junior Sagano Dos Santos, with a record of 17 wins and three losses. Takes on the number nine ranked fighter in the division, former Strike Force, and I believe, dream heavyweight champion, Alistair the Ream Overeem, with a current record of 39 wins, 14 losses, and a single no contest. He also, as people you are well aware, is a was a former K1 champion. Now, the winner of this fight could very well align themselves for a shot at the title. They will be in contention with Stipe Miocic, the uh, Stipe Miocic, Andre Arlovsky winner, who t- that fight takes place at UFC 195. But the winner of this certainly puts themselves front and center. And uh, keep in mind, both of these men hold victories over the current champion, Fabricio Verdum. And that's something that, you know, they'll probably play up if they, whoever comes out of this thing. I've already beat the champ, give me an opportunity to do so with the belt on the line. Now, this fight has actually been in the works for a long time. It was originally scheduled to take place at UFC 160 back in 2013. Junior Dos Santos, uh, coming into this fight, has been out of over, over a year. And Alistair Overeem, since uh, his last, since Junior last fought, Overeem has fought one other time. I believe they fought on the same card, actually, with a Fox event. Uh, that Junior uh, headlined. Physically, both guys are six foot four. Overeem a three inch reach advantage, twenty five pounds heavier. For the Brazilian, he will be he is four years younger than his opponent. Now, looking at these guys, you can't talk about these two fighters without talking about their knockout numbers. They both have significant knockout numbers. For Overeem, sixteen wins by knockout, including stopping Stefan Struve, Brock Lesnar, and. Uh, Todd Duffy outside of the UFC. For Junior Dos Santos, of his 17 career wins, 12 have come by either TKO or KO, and he's got some very impressive names, and I'll run, them, run down a few of them quickly. Uh, Mark Hunt, Frank Mir, Kane Velasquez, Gabriel Gonzaga, Stefan Struve, and Fabricio Verdum, the current champion. In a fight I remember, I predi- I, it was before I started doing predictions, I picked Junior. He was like a 4-1 to underdog to win. It was a great, he clocked him with a big uppercut. I'd say Junior, based on those names, has a far better list, even if you go back deeper in Overeem's uh, record. Junior has the advantage in quality of opposition knocked out. Also keep in mind, Overeem has been knocked out himself nine times. His last five defeats have all been by some by some form of TKO or KO, including losses to Ben Rothwell, Travis Brown, Antonio Bigfoot Silva, Sergei Heratonov, and Shogun Hua when Overeem was competing at light heavyweight, which is shocking to a lot of people. For Junior Santos, he has been knocked out just once, which came at the hands of Cain Velasquez. He was also battered by Cain Velasquez in what was the second meeting of the trifecta of fights they've had. And in his last fight against Stipe Miocic, he went through absolute hell to win a decision. It was a brutal and grueling matchup. Question one of the questions with Junior Santos is, is his tough, toughness going to be... Uh, going to compromise his ability to take strikes. Has it already compromised his ability to take strikes? As he has certainly had years shaved off his life because he's just goes through wars against Kane, against Stephen Mayo, just, just goes through absolute brutal battles. And even though he survived two of the three of them, it's still, you know, it's it's hard on a body. Uh, Velasquez, it took him all the way to the fifth round to eventually put Junior down. That's how tough the guy is, and Velasquez beat him pillar to post and violently. For Overeem, he has been put down with just a limited number of strikes. A lot of times just one off, lands, he's hurt, and they finish him. So that's a very big juxtaposition how they're able to deal with damage. When you look at Overeem, though, he was outclassing Bigfoot Silva in that matchup. Another fight I predicted as a big upset with Bigfoot before Bigfoot was able to stop him in the third round. Overeem almost stopped Travis Brown before he was put down all inside the opening five minutes. And against Ben Rothwell, Overeem is having success. Didn't seem to be in a lot of trouble. Boom, Rothwell clips him, and the fight is all over again inside the opening five minutes. Cardio has been another big question mark for both men, but again, to different degrees. For example, the Brazilian has uh, slowed down uh, slowed down significantly in the Velasquez fights, and he slowed down against Tipe Maochik, but it took a l- so did Stipe, as it was a grueling matchup, but it was the product and pace of Kane and just the overall grueling nature of the last fight that he had and the punishment absorbed by Junior against Stipe that caused him to slow down, and it took a long time to get him tired. For Overeem, we know he slows down very quickly in fights. When he gasses out, he gasses hard, and he is not the same fighter. Both of these scenarios, ability to take damage and the cardio favor the Brazilian. Overeem can't keep a pace that will wear Junior out, and he certainly doesn't have the ability to the, take the damage that Junior does, at least in what we've seen. But again, at heavyweight, anything you know can happen. If Junior might be able to land one shot and put Overeem down, the, the same could go, come because it, it, you know, with I said, with the damage taken by Junior, has he reached his threshold in punishment? For Junior, he's exceptionally confident in his boxing. He has that massive overhand right. He also likes to jab to the body, which is a good setup for him to come over the top and knock guys out. His ability to take damage. Uh, sorry, um, he has a nice uh, left jab. As I said, nice. Right, left hook, he'll also work in. Maybe not full power, but certainly can do some damage. That big uppercut, which he stopped Verdun with, is a constant threat. Against Mark Hunt, who's got an iron chin, he dropped Hunt with a massive right hand and put him down with a sp- spinning back kick, which was darn impressive. Uh, put him down there. 
as I said, he was getting busted up by the combinations of Majocic who and started headhunting a little bit. But again, Stipe was using a lot of pressure, and that's something that Overeem doesn't necessarily do. For Overeem, he's trying to be more paced, more calculated in a strike and conserve his gas tank, be, you know, a alleviate some of those defensive issues he's had look for him to try and throw big knees especially in the clinch we saw him put down travis brown he was able to turn his body and drive a knee right into his midsection he will also throw in that range he has a tendency to launch himself across the cage and throw that big knee and it, he lifts his head up and raises his chin when he does so and if junior times him he is going to blast him and knock him into oblivion watch for that scenario not gonna it might not happen but i'm saying watch for it uh, over him also throws a nice front kick. He's developing an oblique kick. He'll also mix in body kick, which can be very effective. He'll also go high. He has that ability and that capable, you know, athleticism. He's a very solid right hand. He looks to incorporate some wrestling. If uh, Junior tries to take him down, look for over him to train, stuff it, and lock in that power guillotine. He has a lot of submissions on his record, especially by that guillotine. Keep in mind, Nelson was able to crack him with one shot at the end of that fight and nearly took him out. We've seen him taken out, as I said, multiple times with one big shot. I think Junior Sanders pushes the pace early, eventually lands something huge. Junior benefits from the time he's taken off, and my prediction is Junior Santos to defeat Alistair Overeem by knockout. Now we come to the main event of the evening, and it is a rematch. It's taking place in the UFC's lightweight division, but this time around, the title is on the line as the newly crowned tr champion Brazilian Rafael Dos Anjos, with a record of 21 wins and 7 losses, takes on the number two ranked fighter on the planet and perennial contender both in the WEC and now the UFC, Donald Cowboy Cerrone, with a record of 28 wins, 6 losses, and a single no contest. Now, Cerrone has been working his way to a title shot on multiple occasions and seem, has had some fights, where he's, you know, including the one against uh, Dos Anjos, where he just couldn't get the victory and ultimately had to take a step back. He is coming into this fight on the strength of eight consecutive wins, which is darn impressive. And that's, those have all been compiled since he lost his last fight against his current opponent. He is not the same man or same fighter since that matchup, and we'll see if that you know plate pays dividends in this fight. For Dos Anjos, he has been building himself up as well. He lost to Khabib Nurmagomedov after the Cerrone fight, which is a big step back. He then went on to win four in a row, including capturing the title. This is his first attempt at a title offense, and we all know talking about champions, you're really not a champion, quote-unquote, in a lot of people's eyes until you have actually defended the belt at least once. This is the first, uh, their first fight took place just over three years ago, and we look at the some of the stats. Significant strikes, Cerrone actually landed one more significant strike, 40-39. to 39. Dos Anjos had more overall strikes at 58-43, to 43, and he outlanded the takedowns 2-1. to one. Since as, as, uh, that fight has said Cerrone's won eight in a row, he stopped five of those eight opponents. Evan Dunham, uh, he stopped, stopped Dunham, Martins, Barboza, Miller, and McDessey. All That's a nice name of uh, victories to hold, to people to have hold victories over. For Dos Santos, as I said, he lost that one fight against Nermo Gomedov, then he's picked up TKO victories over Jason High, uh, Benson Henderson, a fight I predicted. He also has decisions over Nate Diaz and Anthony Pettis. So, these guys have taken out a lot of the big names in the division. For Dos Anjos, or physically Cerrone, three inches taller, he'll have a five-inch height, sorry, he has a three-inch reach advantage, five-inch height advantage, the champ is one year younger. For uh, Dos Anjos, he's a third-degree black, BJJ black belt, four wins by knockout, eight by submission, he's 12 and five on the scorecards. With Cerrone, he has five wins by knockout, 15 submission wins, eight and four in decisions. I, I, you don't, I don't think he has an actual BJJ accreditation yet, uh, or belt, yet he is uh, incredibly talented on the mat. We're well aware of that. Both guys have been finished by submission and knockout once each to go along with their decision defeats. Cerrone, in the statistical category, has a positive one strike landed per minute advantage over Dos Anjos, but he also gets hit about 1.4 strikes more per minute. So you see the, you know, it's fairly close there. For Dos Anjos, he averages 2.65 takedowns at a 44% completion rate. Cerrone defends almost 70% of his opponent's takedowns, and we'll talk about that momentarily. Uh, the first fight, close exchanges early on before the Brazilian landed a big right hand while he, while he was moving forward and put Cerrone down, and that really changed the complexion of that matchup. It separated him in the opening round and really put things, you know, turned things on its head. He scored a t some takedowns, took Cerrone's back, and while Cerrone was active when he was fighting, especially in his guard, Dos Anjos was holding top position, and that gave him a lot of the advantage in that matchup. We saw Dos Anjos defending submissions. He started landing some ground and pound. Nice take. You know, Cerrone did fire back with a nice takedown in round two, but it simply was not enough. Uh, Dos Anjos, you know, didn't land all his takedowns. Cerrone, you know, stuffed a couple of his attempts, but eventually Donald ended up on his back. Not a ton of vol uh, kicking volume in that fight from the Cowboy, which certainly is one of his big weapons. I think it was the fear of getting taken down. And keep in mind as well, he was cracked early on in that matchup, and that really takes, you know, can, can hurt a guy and, and cost him a fight. For Cerrone, his big weapons, he has that beautiful stepping knee. He will throw both, uh, you know, aggressively as this first strike or as a counter. 
Uh, look from a train, pulls opponent's head down into his knee strikes, and that makes it that much more effective. He has that brutal hard body kick. He also throws some very nice low kicks, which we saw to, him use to slow down Eddie Alvarez. And he has this very slick hands, a nice combination striker. And, uh, you know, overall, he's got a very complete and very dangerous and, you know, very multi dimensional striking attack. When he fought McDessie, he was throwing some very hard combinations. He was mixing in his head kick. He threw a very nice, quick little low kick to set up that head kick. He went high and broke McDessie's jaw and forced him to stop the fight, which was darn impressive. Also, he has nice elbows and knees and combinations. Again, he'll throw that. And, he, you know, he was cracked by a big hand, from, uh, right hand from Eddie Alvarez. He is vulnerable defensively. That seems to be the hand. Again, that's the hand Junior Dos Santos, or sorry, Rafa, Rafael Dos Santos hit him with. Again, lots of Brazilian names on this card, uh, too. Uh, nonetheless, he seems to be vulnerable from the from the right side. For the champion, he has a you know a nice right jab. He used constant pressure when he beat Anthony Pettis. He cut off the cage exceptionally well. He did a nice job of cornering Benson Henderson in that matchup and really you know shutting his offense down and then getting his own off. He cracked Henderson with a brutal overhand left, which really started the whole scenario that put him again down. He hit him with it again, swarmed him, landed a knee strike, and eventually put him away with that left, forced the referee to jump in. Another upset prediction I called. Uh, against Pettis, I think he broke him. He just put so much pressure on him, made it a dirty fight. It really took Pettis out of his comfort zone. Uh, he used prolonged top control, very good hard elbows from top position, good top pressure overall. He was stacking Pettis. Uh, and just every time Pettis tried to get anything going, good level changes that ultimately you know shut down Pettis' offense. Now, both fighters have made significant strides since they last fought, but I think Cerrone, and I think Cerrone striking is still his best weapon. It's his wrestling that has come a long way and is making him a more effective fighter. Of his last... Since that loss, his opponents have thrown 23 total takedown attempts at, at him. He has been taken down twice. And he's fought some very good grapplers, some decent wrestlers. That's impressive. If Dos Anos can't take him down, that takes away one of the big aspects he used in his last fight against Pettis and against the win over Cerrone. I think Cerrone's improved wrestling is going to keep the exchanges vertical. I think his varied attack, his ability to both still throw kicks because he's got more confidence in his wrestling is going to show up. I think he's got a more diversified attack, and that reach and ability to hit you at a distance where Rafael has to come in is going to show up big. Now, one thing, I don't want to accuse anybody of anything, but we have seen since the PED ban and the, and the greater testing has played a role. We've seen some Brazilians um, who have been suspended or at least accused or people considering it's a possibility. We've seen them have issues. Uh, Pedro Munoz was one guy. Another guy everybody pointed out was Eric Silva. And a lot of people have pointed at Rafael dos Anjos. And we, I wonder if that might play a role. It's just a thought. But I wonder if we're going to see a different fighter coming into this matchup after that. I don't know. I'm probably wrong. I'm not making any accusations. I'm just stating something that's you know been brought up and talked about. Skill-wise, and the way I think it's going to play, I think Cerrone's going to land some big knees. Those counter knees is going to catch Rafael Dos Anjos coming forward. I think the low kicks, he'll take a lot of the spring out of Dos Anjos' uh, movement. He takes away a lot of that movement, less, makes him less effective as a striker, counters him as he's coming in. I think he lands something big, possibly a head kick, swarms him on the mat for either a TKO victory or a submission on a dazed opponent. He has been submitted before, you know, even though he's a BJ black belt. And my prediction is Donald Cowboy Cerrone to defeat Rafael Dos Anjos and win the UFC's lightweight championship. And as I, you know, we've seen recently, the carousel of champions will continue. Cerrone, new champion, winning by TKO. So those are my four main card predictions for UFC on Fox 17, all of my preliminary breakdowns, and I believe there are nine preliminary fights, so I have to get to work that'll be posted on my website. Please check them out. Buy the bet packs, 10 bucks for the last one of the year. I can get a couple weeks off. Check out my award show. My DraftKings has been buzzing. You want it? If you're playing DraftKings, it's it's a lot of fun. I've, I've had success personally, and a lot of people I said people have had success as well playing my teams. You know, it comes and goes, highs and lows, but certainly, you know, if you cash in big like some of the people did last week, it makes those lows much more tolerable. Uh, either way, this is my last prediction show. You'll hear from me one more time with my award show, but always thank you for tuning in. Hopefully 2016 continues to be a good year for all of us. Uh, the best, uh, you know, Merry Christmas or whatever holiday you happen to celebrate. The best to you and your family, and I hope you enjoy this time of year. And uh, again, as I said, thank you for listening and tuning in. Follow us on Twitter and Facebook, and uh, take care, guys.